there is a chair and there's a piece of a brass belt buckle next to a chair leg on the floor and it has something to do with the trajectory and the ricochet of this bullet it was a it was, a, it was an important part of the case the photo in exhibit 20 was taken before the photo in exhibit 19. sure but by marking them in sequence as 19 and 20 they suggest to a jury they were not they were taken they were not in that sequence uh, yes, they sure, had flipped sure. the sequence of the photographs and the, def the prosecution didn't catch it when the facts are aligned against you you've got to do something so sure. the only way of doing something is to change the facts somehow you have to manipulate it somehow you have to create confusion and that's what lawyer games is about testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial in richland county history dr john boyle is accused of killing his wife noreen and burying her body in the basement of his new home in erie pennsylvania the 12 year old son finally took the stand as i heard a scream i heard a thud it was about this loud we the jury find the defendant guilty when i was 12 years old my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother this podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself and it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Hey, movers, what's going on? I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. I just want to say it's been really cool getting to know a lot of you during my IG Lives, which I have every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, on my Instagram channel, which is at Collier Landry, which should be like right there. And uh, I love just getting to know you guys and getting, you guys ask me questions. You ask me questions about my story, about my life. I can ask you questions. And so I want to thank you guys for tuning in. And if you are watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. It helps with the algorithm. You guys know the drill. Thank you very much. Okay. So speaking of people who are contacting me, I want to just, you know, the world is in predicament, if we will put it nicely. As of today, there are 1 million Ukrainians who have been displaced from their homes because of this war. While I have not been involved in war in the sense of guns and fighting, I have been involved in a personal war. And that was uh, of my father murdering my mother. And I can remember on the early morning hours of January 24th, 1990, when I was awoken by two total strangers in my bed who literally told me, Pack your bags. You've got 20 minutes. Uh, little did I know that I would never be back to my house again. And uh, I had to pack bag and toys and clothes. And they, you know, they said, you're going to be gone for a couple of days, which was not true. <laughs> they said I could come and get my dog and that never happened. And so I said goodbye to my dog. At that time, I was 11 years old and I had pretty much lost my world. And then that was just one more thing, you know, losing my mother, my father, eventually, uh, and my entire family and then my way of life. So as someone who has been displaced by a tragedy, I am with you guys 100%. Um, I know what it's like to have that feeling of not knowing what is going on in your world. So... Um, Look, my heart goes out to you. Um, I pray for you guys every day. On that note, you know, I have started reading messages every week from listeners and fans that that write in. And this week is, I, I have asked, because I do have people from the Ukraine on my IG lives, and I do have people who respond on YouTube and through Instagram and my social medias, Twitter. This is Katrin Banch. Yesterday I posted a video and I put the uh, famous Tommy Hearns, John Carlos fist in the air for equality with the Ukrainian colors of yellow and blue. And she noticed that and she wanted to say thank you. And she said, thanks from the Ukraine. I live here and the ring of hell shrinks around us. Um, again, I have never been a victim of war. Thank God. Uh, but I do know what it is like to be literally uprooted from everything you have ever known in your way of life. And I'm with you. I know what it feels like. And my heart breaks for you guys, but I I'm with you. So on that note, let's get into the episode. My guest today is a gentleman named Depp Kirkland. Depp was the assistant D, one of the assistant DAs in a case, this case came to national prominence through a film that was directed by the amazing Clint Eastwood. It was called Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And for those of you who are Jude Law fans, you will remember this was like his 
first like breakout role. My conversation today with Depp delves into the American justice system, specifically how evidence can be manipulated by both sides, but specifically when the defense, and especially a defense that is backed by a prominent and wealthy individual. There were three mistrials, I believe, in this case. Um, and then I think the fourth ended in a conviction. There are definitive differences to a level of standards that prosecutors and defense attorneys are held to in this country. It's pretty fascinating. And um, again, with my case and my father being a doctor and having his own little high powered team of lawyers, you know, I never knew what was going to happen if he was going to get convicted, if he was going to be, you know, released. And it was very scary for me because I took the step of testifying against him and I'm the one that alerted the police and found the house. And anyways, <laughs> I digress on that. But it's an interesting conversation with him for sure. Now, he wrote a book called Lawyer Games and we are going to discuss all those games that lawyers play because I'm fascinated having been in both sides with the criminal case against my father, civil cases that I had with legal people that were involved um, after the trial. And for those of you who watched the documentary of Murder in Mansfield, you know that my mother really wanted me to be a lawyer. And sometimes I consider maybe that might have been a good idea. I don't know. Anyways, it's fascinating to listen to Depp now. He does go into further depth about the case and his role in it in another episode that I'm releasing as a bonus next Wednesday, which is March 8th or 9th, I believe. You will get to hear uh, Depp explain the case and his role in it more. It, it'll be very raw and unedited, but you know, if you guys are curious, you can hear it. Here to discuss all the wonderful games that lawyers play is my guest, Depp Kirkland. So Depp, tell me about lawyer games. I have a little bit of an experience in this, in both uh, the criminal and civil arenas, but uh, I would love to hear from someone uh, such as yourself who has straddled both sides of the fence. You have been a trial lawyer for the defense of uh, the accused and also on the other side, the uh, working for the prosecutor's office. We would love to hear some of these, uh, these stories that I'm sure you have. Well, I have a few. Um, I, I think uh, to relate to why the title, right? So why the title of the book? Because the subtitle is After Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. So it's a, it started off as an examination of this re renowned murder case from Savannah called Midnight. It's the William, Jim Williams prosecution for murder of, of young Danny Hansford. Okay. It was made into a movie by Clint Eastwood, that whole thing. Eastwood sure. Space Night. So it started out as an examination of that remarkable case that went on for nine and a half years through four murder trials. But what, what happened with me in going back and reviewing all of that I went back and I said, well, I'm going to do a review of this because I was gone after the first trial. Okay. Then I pulled every piece of evidence. I looked at every scrap of evidence, whether it had been admitted, whether it hadn't been admitted. I looked at every statement of every witness. I looked at every affidavit. I read every transcript from beginning to end because I, I said, well, I'm going to have to look at this. Well, what happened during the course of that. And I follow true crime to some extent, infamous cases. O.J. Simpson, obviously, Phil Spector, Phil Side Strangler, all of these types of cases. And I started to see a pattern of behavior because I'm watching, it, you know, it's interesting that after the fact, when you go back and look at something, it's a lot easier than when you're in the, in the battle and you're in the middle of it and things are happening so fast. If you can go back and look at this, what started to look, what started to pop out to me was, oh, I see what they did there. I see, I see what this, I see what the defense attorney did, particularly in the Williams case. Wait a minute. He's asking this witness. He's asking the prosecution's witness about blood splatter. He's asking about gunshot residue. He's asking about positions of this or that. And he leads right up to the edge of the conclusion. But he didn't ask him that question. Why didn't he ask him that question? That's interesting. Well, this started and then it continued to repeat itself. I mean, wait a minute. There was an issue of uh, uh, like uh, you know, expert testimony in in uh, the OJ the, the Simpson case, and and even later in the case in Italy of uh, the well Solicito was the other guy's name uh, the Amanda Knox case. Oh yeah, Amanda Knox. Yeah, right. A lot of blood evidence, DNA evidence, DNA evidence, and I now they, was they it, with this. Uh, 
Amanda Knox acquitted or eventually because there was eventually. a there's a recent documentary I believe about this correct yes, there is. I, okay which I have not seen yet oh, I, I have read every decision of the Italian courts I looked at all the evidence in that case I do get a little involved in this stuff because it didn't make any sense to me and sure. there was something that happened in that case for example that also happened in the Simpson case where they were talking about the fact that DNA was was found on the bra clasp that was cut off of Meredith Kircher the night that she was killed. It belonged to Amanda Knox's boyfriend. They claimed they'd never, he was never there, none of this. How did his DNA get on the bra clasp of the dead girl? And they, so I, I saw it, there was testimony from an expert forensic scientist in Italy that there was uh, dirt found in the area and that apparently the collect, people who collected the evidence had allowed it to become contaminated. And if you recall, go back to O.J. Simpson, contamination, contamination of blood samples is a theme. Oh, the blood samples became contaminated. The blood sample, well, here's the thing. This is DNA evidence. No two people have the same DNA. Sure. Putting dirt on a bra clasp cannot put a human being's DNA on the bra clasp that was never in contact with it. So, Same with the blood. So, so I start to see these patterns in William's case about how questions are asked and how uh, there, there's an example. There were, there were crime scene photos, many of them taken in the Williams case. And the position of evidence, positions of certain things were important because as I mentioned, there were only two people there. The defendant said it was self-defense and it's all about the physical evidence. Everything is about that physical evidence. So here they go. There were a hundred plus photos taken. Today, digital age, it probably would have been 500, but there were a hundred plus photos taken. The ID officer began to photos, photograph the scene when she got there before anything was touched, right? To memorialize the position of everything at the beginning of the investigation. She continued to take photographs. As they processed the scene and the detective showed up, she continued to take photographs of that process. All right, we get to trial. And this was in the second trial or the third. You get to the trial with the new lawyers. They go through these photographs. And they, I'll give you one example. There is a chair and there's a piece of a brass belt buckle next to a chair leg on the floor and it has something to do with the trajectory and the ricochet of this bullet it was a it was a clear it was an important part of the case so they have a uh, prosecution detective on the stand defense pulls out a, a photograph they have it marked and i'm going to give an example as defense exhibit 19. fine what is this well that's the chair here's the belt bucket okay fine i'm going to show you now another photograph and they had it marked as defendants exhibit 20. well guess what the chair has moved. It's in a different position. Somebody has moved the chair. Now, here's the thing. When the ID officer herself, who took all these photographs, was on the stand, she offered to take the proof sheets and put the photographs in order. And the defense counsel said, that's not necessary. Guess why it's not necessary? The photo in exhibit 20 was taken before the photo in exhibit 19. Sure. But by marking them in sequence as 19 and 20, they suggest to a jury they were not, they were taken they were not in sequ that sequence. Uh, yes, they true, had flipped sure. the sequence of the photographs and the, def the prosecution didn't catch it. So well, is I that something that, so is that, it's a, it's a, sorry to interrupt you, but is just to clarify for our listeners, is that something that the defense can manipulate rather easily? Because obviously both sides are, or, or defense is allowed discovery, right? Right. And right. in discovery, are they allowed to say, well, we need to, sh we should be able to change instead of this is picture 20 and picture 19, we should be able to flip these because I feel this is, you know, they, they approach the judge and say, we want to label this exhibit 19 and 20 versus, you know, 20 and 19 or whatever. Is that something that's common? Is that a way that they can, because I, I, I feel again, lawyer games, there's yes. a lot of gamesmanship involved, especially in the American justice system, but perhaps throughout the world, that allows people, especially if you have enough juice to pay the lawyers, 
to for them to really craft when a defendant is clearly guilty of something for them to to craft to craft another narrative that sort of runs alongside that becomes the main narrative absolutely that they give to a jury yeah yeah well as as you've mentioned when someone when the facts are when the facts are aligned against you you've got to do something so the only way of doing something is to change the facts somehow you have to manipulate it somehow you have to create confusion and that's what lawyer games is about i actually do a presentation i created it's called uh, the American Criminal Jury Trial, a playground for legal delinquents. There's a certain species of lawyer, and I've talked to Brenda about this. It is what I call the lust for the W. It's about winning. Sure. And there are some who will not pass, cross that line. There are others that do it every day. And are they allowed to do it? Well, for example, in the case of the photographs, those photographs, they assign those exhibit numbers because it's their exhibit. They're just like, I'm going to mark this you know, picture of whatever as exhibit. The actual numbers of the photographs on the proof sheet don't change. They just pull two of them out and use them to put them in opposite directions. Now, what could happen if you're alert to that and the, pros- the prosecution didn't pick it up? in this case. That's why I say it's a lot easier after the fact to go sit and read a deposition or read a transcript and say, wait a minute, let me go look at these photos. And that's what I did, because that's what I do. Sure. I look at the photos. I said, wait a minute. That chair was moved in the processing of the scene because the detective had to move it over so that he could take pic- she could take pictures of the debris on the desk. That's why it was moved. It was moved in the normal course of business. They, their job doesn't the defense job is not to uh is not to solidify the normal course of business it's not to Got repeat it. the prosecution's yeah. evidence it's to it's find to a way to use the jury yeah. yeah right there's one in the in the simpson case is very interesting that and this is what we do this is what we as defense lawyers do when you're defending you don't have a case you don't have a case there's a, a quote that's attributed to uh, bobby lee cook who tried the first case defended the first case famous murder defendant, uh, attorney, not, not defendant, <laughs> attorney. And he is quoted, not in this case, but he was quoted earlier. And I think he stole it from me because I made this argument in the, in the, in the case, in the first Williams case. If you have a criminal defendant who's charged with murder, you need to prove two things. You need to prove whether or not he killed the person he's accused of killing. And then you need to prove whether or not the person needed killing. That's what they did. I know it's, a, it's kind of a joke, but that's what they did with him. They turned him into somebody that you didn't care about. We talked about his, his, his psychiatric exam. He's a crazy, he rages. He's a crazy guy. He's a kid who's out of control. He lost control. He blew up. He attacked Williams. They painted this picture, like you said. It's a narrative. They have to change the narrative to support their position now when it get the physical evidence gets in the way then they do things i call this debate in the switch there's the uh, there's the expert uh, witness who'll say anything who flip bodies who the, the, the three shots of this the, the the dead kid danny hansford in this case the three shots the last shot as i mentioned goes through his back directly into the floor and yet william said he never rounded the desk i think that was a coup de gras i think he rounded the desk and he finished him off Well, he can't have that be true because it shows that that's what he did. So he says, I was behind the desk the whole time. So you know what they did? The defense expert changed the sequence of the bullets and actually claimed he had to rotate the body to do that because he had to get the body facing the floor somehow to get that bullet. So they switched bullet holes. He used the same bullet hole in the floor for two of the shots through the body. And I'm like, I didn't find that until later. I said, wait a minute. But it's when I'm reviewing things. In the moment, you don't know what he's doing. So they do. They try to confuse people and they try to, and it's important. That's what and they, they do. Make, and they like, often will make the victim out to be the bad guy. Absolutely. You so, have to prove that they killed him and that he needed killing. So now, in your opinion, in your opinion, is this very characteristic of specifically the American justice system? Or is this characteristic of any justice system? This is sort of modus operandi for a defense team to I, I think do the blame is, the I victim think, type thing. I think it's. I think it's. Just, I think it is a symptom of any system 
where winning becomes important. And that's every system. Now, here's the difference. The United States is the only modern nation in the world that does not allow the prosecution to appeal a verdict in a criminal case. Oh, so, really? Here's what happens. And I didn't the know other you countries asked, allowed that. That's they all interesting. Do. You asked about Amanda Knox. The reason that case became so complicated was that it went up on appeal several times. The first appeal went up because it, there were complaints about the processing of the case by the prosecution about the judge handling the case. So what happens in the United States? Well, they retry cases all the time. They retry cases all of, the time. Or is that their sort of uh, way of appealing? But here's the thing. If a, if a defendant, they can't appeal... They can't appeal a conviction. I'm sorry. They cannot appeal a verdict of not guilty. Correct. So what happens in the American justice system is that you do, as a defense counsel, anything you can do because you will never be called to task for it. I don't know of any criminal defense attorney who has ever been sanctioned by a bar association for conduct during the trial of a criminal case. If they can get away with it, the defendant can walk out the front door and confess, and there's nothing you can do about it. So what it does is it encourages, to me, I think it encourages that behavior because you know that if you can get a not guilty verdict, no matter what you had to do to get it, then you're done and there's you're never going to see that case again. It's double jeopardy. You cannot retry the case. And that's so, why that's been said in, in cases here in the United States, people have claimed about certain famous cases, well, that's double jeopardy. In, in and the that's the Sixth case. Amendment, correct? Double jeopardy yeah. that protects us against yeah. double jeopardy. So and they complained about Amanda Knox for that reason. People said, wait a minute, this is double jeopardy. She's been tried already. It's not double jeopardy in Italy because the verdict isn't final until it has gone through the appellate process and everyone has had a chance because the goal is supposed to be to get it right. Not about winning, it's about getting it right. We have a different system, so I'm not saying that everybody is evil. They're not. All defense attorneys are not. I was telling sure. Brenda, there is a case involved, you know, Phil Spector case, right? The Phil Spector case. There became, there was an allegation made in that case that Dr. Henry Lee, the famous forensic scientist from Boston, yeah, he came yeah. in for the defense. There was testimony. There was a complaint from a detective that was on the defense team, actually, that he had thought he had seen Dr. Lee at the scene when he came later to, re, to, to view the scene, that he thought he had seen Dr. Lee pick something up from the scene and take it with him. And it had never appeared. He hadn't seen that at whatever it was, nobody ever saw it again, so he didn't know what it was. So he makes this allegation, he says, I don't know what it was, but I swear to you, I saw him lean over and pick something up. Now in that case, Spectre had shot Laura, I forget her last name, I'm sorry. Uh, that he had met at the House of Blues. They'd gone home. It was the middle of the night. Yes, yes. And, she, you know, he claimed that she had committed suicide suddenly with his gun. Blah. All right. She had acrylic fingernails. One of the tips of one of her acrylic fingernails had been, was missing. Okay. Now, so there was some suggestion. Well, I wonder if that was part of her fingernail, because if it's her fingernail, it shows that her hands were up in a defensive posture when she was shot and that she was not committing suicide on her own. Okay, well, it's a little it's a little murky because nobody knows. The only reason was Judge Fiddler in the LA Superior Court that heard this complaint about Henry Lee, the only reason that it was resolved was that a member of the defense team, a female whose name I don't remember, I wish I did, she should have a statue put up somewhere. She stood up in court and said, I cannot go along with this, I saw him do it. He picked it up in a handkerchief and he took it with him and he got rid of it. Wow. Henry Lee should never be on a stand again. No. But it doesn't come up because it, you know what? It doesn't come up because there's no point in it. So it was the tip of her acrylic finger. Now, now so I guess my point is all of the systems are the same. And, the, you know, the lust for winning is something that doesn't just happen in criminal cases it happens in sports too sure. you can have two people see the exact same play and one's a giants fan and one's a, a an eagles fan and they could be sitting next to each other 
and they will swear to you they saw something completely different. Right. And there are people who may be in a case, particularly say basketball, never touched him. Well, yeah, maybe you did. And maybe you shoved a little bit. Maybe you did a little something because you want to win so badly that sometimes maybe you'll even take steroids. Maybe you'll even cheat. That calls into to question the officiating in this because LeBron James always gets his hand hands put on him like no other player and doesn't get the calls. I just want to say that for the record. Yeah, <laughs> it is about that. It's this lust to win. It's about what will you do? Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine today about this because he follows all of this. Very big uh, true crime fan. I told him I was going to do this thing with you guys. He's so excited about it. He's read the book 40 times. I mean, he's that kind of guy, right? And he uh -huh. said, you know, here's the thing. He said, I really believe that people who will cut corners in life, if you make them into a lawyer, they become that kind of lawyer. And it is not, let me be very clear, it is not unique to the defense bar. There are prosecutors who do the same thing. It's just that you never read, and what happens is people will appeal, and you'll have a record made, right? And so you can read about the case where the prosecutor was found to have planted evidence or to have done this or sure. to have, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see those cases involving what defense attorneys do because there is no appeal if they are not convicted. So there's no record and there's no appellate decision and there's no there aren't any of those cases. So it's yeah. interesting how we don't see those, but it, both sides will do it. Anybody that wants to cheat to win will cheat to win. So they so would you say that defense attorneys are held to a different set of standards than than prosecutors that, that work Absolutely. for the state? Absolutely, because their behavior is never reviewed. It's like, I mean, it's a kid with, it's like a kid who knows that they're never going to get caught doing whatever it is they want to do. I mean, it's just, it's human nature. There's nothing you can do about it. In many cases, I, prosecutors get to decide what they take to court. If you walk into a court with a case, you better know your case and you better be there for a reason and you better have a pretty good grasp of it. Defense lawyers don't get that opportunity. They get somebody who comes to them to defend them. They get handed a case so they can end up in a courtroom with a case that isn't so good for their client. So how do you, what do you end up doing? You end up trying to find some way to get a jury so confused. And these people, again, don't do this every day. There is a review. I had some people read this book and give me some you know, feedback on it. One of them is somebody named Aphrodite Jones. Aphrodite Jones used to do Af true crime with Aphrodite Jones. Sure. On, I think it was ABC. She was on there for years. She had this sh show and I know her and she read the book and she had a comment about it which I think is on the back of the book or somewhere. And she said, anyone who reads this book will never again look the same way at a criminal trial. Here's sort of taking the, the, the facade off to show you what's really going on when a lawyer asks a question a certain way. Why they asked that witness and they didn't ask this witness. Why they followed up with their witness and they didn't use the prosecution witness that they already had right up to the edge of the case. The thing about, you know, will they swap photographs? Yes. Uh, will they destroy evidence? I hope not. But that is the kind of thing that a jury, unless you're on a jury, unless that's your job is to be on juries and it's not, you come off the street and you don't know what's going on. You don't know what they're doing. Sure. Half the time, you don't know what they're talking about. And then the judge says, oh, come up here. We'll go, we'll take the jury out. The jury goes out. They don't like that. I'm like now they're talking about stuff. We don't even get to hear. This is all a game. We don't know what they're doing. And and they try to trust people. They want to believe that what people are telling them is true. And if somebody stands up, here's something uh, that, that, that I have said before to people. I said, you know what? And I, had, I tried a case once, defense, as a defense attorney. Uh -huh. And I, had, I said, here's the thing defense attorneys don't like. And it happens all the time. You're standing up and you're making an argument or you're cross-examining a witness. And your client is sitting next to you. And they start tugging on your pants leg. Or they, what they do, they start scribbling a note and shoving it over so you can see it. And it says, I'm making this up, you know, and, and, and because it does happen, but they don't say this. They'll say, you know, the son of a bitch is lying. They're lying. I said, yeah, well, that's kind of how it works. Oh, well, I'm supposed to just tell, I'm supposed to make an announcement to the court. They're lying. Said, Here's the thing. You take an oath as a witness to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you whatever you want to swear to. Unfortunately, lawyers don't do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. so, That's what I was just thinking. I was like, they don't, they don't, they don't take an oath. Yeah. Right. They just, they well, just gotta pass the, the bar. Were, no, they don't. But if a witness, if that oath meant anything, and it means something to some people, 
it doesn't mean something to a lot of people. No, people still lie. Uh, guess what? They lie. They take an oath and they lie. People lie all the time. Sure. And it isn't easy to find out what they're lying about. And here's the thing about, about what happens on the defense side because of the American system. This is very interesting to me. I did not know that, by the way, about appeals. I, am, I knew it. I just had never thought about it. Somebody who writes for, for uh, uh, legal, writes for Bloomberg, I think, or somebody on legal matters. And she mentioned this to me. She said, you realize there's no appeal by the prosecution in the United States? I said, well, I knew that. I just never thought about what it meant and what it does, does to the behavior on the other side. Mm-hmm. So there was this situation in the Simpson case where Barry Sheck, another one of those guys, he argues to the jury that evidence in a criminal case is like a chain. And if any link of the chain is broken, the case collapses. Well, that's not the way it works. And that's not the law. But that's the approach is they'll go after everything and try to create doubt somewhere, some part of the case. The truth is it doesn't matter. If you have a video that's legitimate of the killing, then the fact that the person had bad eyes or that it was dark or doesn't matter. It's an accumulation of evidence. And I talked about, you know, Vincent Bugliosi talking about evidence as a rope or a, or a cord. And if you remove one piece of it, it doesn't go away. It becomes perhaps less, less thick and less strong. It doesn't go away. It's not a chain. And in the end of the Simpson case, this is fascinating to me. After the O.J. Simpson verdict the, in the criminal case, the chairperson of the jury was interviewed. And she was asked specifically about the blood at the crime scene. There were drops of blood at the scene that were never questioned. There was never any testimony by anybody that they were anything other than O.J. Simpson's blood. The contamination was about other blood. It was not about that blood. And I don't remember if it was three blood, three drops, two drops, four drops. Drops of blood at the scene of the killing. That was, it was his blood. No doubt about it. And they asked her about it. Well, what about the blood at the crime scene? And her answer was astounding. What she blood? said, we didn't really, we didn't think that much about that because that was not the reasonable doubt that we found. What? We went out and we found some reasonable doubt somewhere else. So we just ignored the blood at the at the crime scene. At the end of the case in the Williams case, to get back to about Williams and crime scene and uh, lawyer games, the assistant DA in that case, named guy named David Locke, terrific lawyer, he was he was stunned when they came back with a not guilty verdict. Sure. And he talked to a member of the jury, a woman who was on the jury. He went to her and he said, do you mind if I ask you a question? So, oh, no, you guys were great. You guys were great. So well, I'm not really it's not about that. He says, <laughs> I don't I just I, I, if you could just tell me. What about the physical evidence? And her answer was, well, what did that have to do with it? What about the physical evidence? Right. What he says, what about the physical evidence? And her response was, what did that have to do with it? Huh. What did that have to do with it? It's a physical evidence case. That's what the case is built on. How did a member of the jury get to a point, the end of that case, of thinking it was about something else? Wow. Apparently they thought they were watching a play. I don't I don't know what it, it became. See, I wasn't there for four, and there's no transcript because it wasn't appealed. But I talked to people who were there, and I guess it's this. They, uh, to to Collier's note about this, they weave a they weave a story, and apparently they had manipulated yes. and well and massaged that story enough mm-hmm. that a jury bought it. That Hansford was crazy. Hansford was out of control. Hansford was a was a punk. And this is why I mentioned I think before that I was contacted by Danny Hansford's nie- um, niece. I think yes, her, he was her uncle. And she heard about my book and she said, I don't know whether or not to read your book. And I want you to tell me because I've seen what was done to my uncle. And not about the killing, but about the, the characterization and the yeah. trash. Yeah, the narrative. Yeah, exactly. Everything. Right? She said, so I don't know if I want to read another one or if I want to see it again. So just tell me what you think. 
And I said, I think it, I, I said, I'll tell you this, your uncle was not a member of the choir at St. Jude's church. He was not. All right. He lived in the street. He had a lot of problems. You probably know that because you grew up around him. Yes, he had a lot of problems in his life. He had a tough, tough childhood. His mother, oh my goodness, I don't know how the kid ended up as as, as okay as he was. Sure. I said, but it didn't, he didn't deserve to be killed because of that. So you can read the book if you like, because I think I do a pretty good job of defending him from the slanderous treatment that he got but you're going to read some things that might not make you real happy to read. Sure, and I don't sure. know if you can say it on uh, your your podcast, but there was a gripping piece of testimony, and I, I'm happy to say it because it's in the record of the case, from a from a Danny Hinchwood's best friend who knew him, knew his girlfriend, the whole thing. He knew the whole scheme. He's the one who testified that Danny used to pick on Williams and how that worked out with the thing, with the car, with the necklace and this and that. And that. Yes. And he yes. said, you know, I asked Danny about what he was doing with Williams. Like, why are you doing this? This man, you said, so this guy, you're living in his house and you're doing, and you know, and you're having sex with him, even though you're not. And he said, and Danny's answer was, you know what? Uh, the guy's rich. If he wants to pay me to suck my whatever, then I'll take the money. So you can't really say Danny Hansford was exactly the kid you really want your daughter to grow up and marry, but that doesn't, and that's what they put. That doesn't make him. That doesn't you know, that, matter. That doesn't, doesn't deserve matter. to die or be, no, or be slandered, or, nope. you know, and having the narrative manipulated. That's you know, this is all very interesting, and I think it, you know, then then I think, you know, this case was what over twenty years ago. Now right. you have a whole. Now you throw things like Twitter and, oh, yeah. and Facebook and yep. YouTube and social media at all uh, into the mix. And now you have a more convoluted narrative that we've seen, you know, yep. recently play out over the last couple of years in our justice system. Right. That's and right. It, it becomes so convoluted. You don't even know which way is up and you don't but even know who's telling the truth. You know what? You don't know which way is up. However, to your point, but everybody knows knows the answer within tw twelve hours. Everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Well, they really don't know. <laughs> but, but they've seen the video. They've seen the tweet. No, they see the cell phone. And they've got oh well, you know what happened. You know this happened. No, you don't. And then they always and then they'll question the jury. I said, you didn't sit through the trial. If you're not in the courtroom and you don't hear all the testimony, just shut up. Get off of social media and stop slinging just junk around about each other. Because what yeah, it does, yeah. to your point, is it, I think it eats at the confidence we have in the system, if we have some. 100%. It, right? Um, everybody has an opinion. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And it's all well. And if, it, and if it's something that you don't agree with, then it's because it was fixed. Well, it had to be fixed if I don't like what happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? You know how lawyers are. You know how they, you know, none of this stuff. It is, uh, it's hard to have confidence in this system, but the truth is, it's what we got. And we like to say, you know, this is a, another point. We like to say, you know what? It may not be perfect, but we have the best system, criminal justice system in the world. Well, you know Absolutely. what? We don't necessarily. There are countries where the other side can appeal regardless. There are countries where you have a panel of judges that hear these cases, where you don't rely on people that are pulled off the street who can get bamboozled so easily it's crazy. Um, there are other systems that do a pretty good job. They also have problems. Sure. But we we don't we don't look outside of ourselves. We all think, well, it's the U.S. We must be great, and we like to say that a lot. Well, it's the best system, and even though we, well, you know what? Most of these people don't even know. It's like the folks who said you can't retry Amanda Knox because it's double jeopardy. And this was somebody on uh, television on network news who was a legal analyst. And I wrote into him my comment. Well, we won't said, we won't go there. We won't go there into the. They obviously don't study international law. <laughs> Those experts. Anyway. Well, Depp, thank you so much for your time. In 30 seconds or less, what do you got up to next? Uh, five films in a row. First one in Georgia, which is why I'm here. And another seven or eight after that. TV shows. I'm in the entertainment business now. I quit. I gave up the law and uh, walked away from it. I never should have been a lawyer. My mother should have been a lawyer. 
She <laughs> suggested I go to law school, and I said, well, I'm not doing anything else. Fine, I'll go. <laughs> and I eventually quit. That was a really interesting conversation with Depp. One of the reasons why I wanted to have him on the program is not only because I really enjoy that movie, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I remember seeing it in the theaters a long time ago. But also, uh, you know, he's seen a side of the law that not many of us get to. I mean, we see these sort of dramas play out on television, I suppose, or in our own fantasy worlds on a true crime podcast, maybe. I don't know. But for the most part, you know, he has an insider's look. And... It's tough because it has me, again, questioning our justice system in a way that I really hadn't done before. Because ultimately, if you look at it, my father was convicted of the murder of my mother. He did have a high-powered team of lawyers, and he ultimately lost, mostly because of the impact of his 12-year-old son. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, however, it, it does make me feel and think about the people who I've interviewed on this program. Like... Melissa McKinnis, for example, who was in a couple episodes ago, who is still looking for justice for her son, Donye Dion Jones, right? And evidence being destroyed and things of that nature. It's, it's heartbreaking. So as much as I, ha as much as I have respect for the justice system and that I feel it served me, it doesn't serve everyone in the same way. And that's unfortunate. And hopefully with conversations like these, we can begin to change that narrative in this country and around the world. Um, I mean, look, life is not fair. It sometimes it really sucks. If life were fair, ultimately my mother would still be here. She wouldn't have been murdered, but that's what it is. I mean, it's tough. It's tough. But um, again, I want to hear from you guys, my listeners. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Murder. Thanks, y'all. This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible. Find us on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Collier Landry. The film A Murder in Mansfield is available on Investigation Discovery, Discovery Plus, and Amazon Prime Video. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio in association with RSA Entertainment. Please visit mpmpodcast.com to show your support today. <laughs>